Awesome. Well, good morning. Good to be with all of you. How are you doing this morning? Good to see you. If you are newer visiting, I always like to say we're glad that you're here. Hope you enjoy worshiping Jesus, our great God and Savior, along with us. My name's Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here who serves under our head pastor, Jesus, and I'm the one that preaches most of the time here. Uh, so some of you, those of you who've been around or part of our church, you notice that things look a little different today, right? Uh, this is sort of the stripped down, minimal, kind of old school throwback uh, Sunday and how it was for a, a lot of Sundays and until God kind of grew us and we were able to do some things and change uh, some things about the building. Most of you know that we have a new permanent facility that we will begin our first Sunday in next week. So pretty exciting. So many of you have come out to contribute and, and take part in helping prepare that place uh, and then fix it up into being a place of worship. And it's just been, we're just all super excited uh, about that. I've sort of been playing a uh, general contractor uh, the last couple of weeks. I spent uh, when I was in, in seminary, when I was a college pastor, I worked for a general contractor that was in the church that I was serving at at the time. And so for, for three years, I did, you know, everything from, you know, concrete to framing and electrical and drywall and plumbing and, and all of that. So uh, I didn't know that those skills would, would come in this handy someday, but it's been, been a blessing. But it's good to actually change hats and be back into pastor mode this morning. I, I can do that stuff, but I enjoy this, this more. So uh, I want to say a couple things before we get into what's going on for today. Um, first of all, uh, we had uh, last week, we had a couple uh, guest preachers, some of the guys that are in our leadership um, development uh, group. We've got, you know, just this increasing bullpen of people that, of guys that want to preach and, and can preach. And so I want to say a special thanks to Ryan Buss and Chris Sandoval. Did an excellent job. Thank you, brothers. We I love you guys. Uh, it's, it's, it's good for me to know that if I, I get hit by a, a bus, everything will be okay. So, um, not that I want to get hit by a bus, um, but anyway, we'll be all right. Uh, I want to say a couple other things. Uh, one of the things that you notice in coming in and seeing how things are different is just how much the BTM, the Building Transformation Ministry uh, groups uh, of our church, they do to fix, to make this place into a house of worship. And so as our kind of last Sunday in this building, I think it'd be just be so appropriate to, to give them a big uh, thanks and say we love you guys. Thank you for serving us. The other crew that does a lot in setting up this place each week to be able to, for us to have worship service here is the, uh, the AV ministry, the audio video, visual crew. I mean, they set up speakers and lines and sound and uh, all the stuff. They just do a ton of behind the scenes work that, that people rarely see and that they rarely ever get credit for. So I want to take a moment to just say, we love you guys. Thank you, AV team. <laughs> all right, so um, things are going to, change up a little bit here for about a, a month uh, in regards to the sermon and what we're going to be preaching. We're going to be taking a little hiatus from Genesis. Uh, this morning I'm going to speech, preach a special message called Remembering the Work of the Lord from part of Psalm 77. Uh, next week we'll have a special sermon in the new building titled Go Tell from Romans 10 where it talks about go, uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who bring the gospel. And so we're going to kind of start out with our first Sunday there with a real missional focus, a go tell people about Jesus and have them come and hear the message of the gospel in this new place. Uh, after that, it'll be Palm Sunday, the week before Easter, and so we have a special sermon titled Prepare the Way, and think about preparing the way for the Lord. Uh, and then it'll be Easter Sunday, and I'm preparing a message titled Real Jesus, how the Jesus that we worship and, and serve isn't a, a figment of our imagination, but it's a real person, God in the flesh, who died on a real cross and rose again to real life and is returning again one day. So that's what we're looking at for the month, and then we'll be back into Genesis. So uh, plan for this morning, title of my sermon is Remembering the Work of the Lord from Psalm chapter 77 and just looking at verses 11 through 15. So why don't I go ahead and read it for us. I'll declare it as God's word and we can thank him for all together by saying thanks be to God and then I'll briefly pray over our time in it this morning. So Psalm 77 beginning verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm, you redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we want to 
to think on you this morning. We want to remember who you are and your works. We want to reflect on your greatness and your goodness. Would we remember your work in, in our hearts, in our lives, and in our, in our church, that you have done work and you still have work to do in us? And I pray especially, Lord, for, for those who, who may be here who have never really experienced your work in their lives. They don't know what it's like to have you work in them. Would you work in us and through us, by your spirit, through your word, for the glory of Jesus, our Savior. In his name I pray, amen. All right, so three things I want to walk through this morning. The call to remember from this passage, the reasons to remember this gives, and then some stories for us to remember as a church that we'll walk through. So first, talking about this psalm, kind of breaking the rule a little bit this morning, and that we're breaking into the middle of a passage. And looking at just verses 11 through 15, that's something normally you shouldn't do because what comes before and after a section of scripture matters a lot. And if you don't take that into account, you can often end up in a really weird and wacky uh, interpretation of that, that passage. So I want to clue us in a little bit into the context and what's going on in this whole chapter since we're not working through all of it. Make sense? Um, this psalm functions like a lot of the psalms do and that it starts out on a pretty low note. Uh, the psalmist, the writer, is, is, is in a, a pretty dark place, a, a sad place, a painful place, feeling a, alone, and is going to the Lord and carrying his petition and his, his cries and his concerns to the Lord. What happens as the psalm progresses is that then he begins to turn his thoughts and his mind on the Lord and the things that God has done. And so it almost starts out, if you're thinking in, in terms of song, it starts out kind of like a dirge, but ends in this happy celebratory hymn almost that's just celebrating the greatness and the goodness of, of who God is. And why I want to point that out is uh, a couple of reasons. One, it, it, it highlights why psalms are so popular. Psalms in the, in the Bible are some of the most popular parts of the Bible for people. And it's because they're so accessible. You can read those, those raw feelings and those raw emotions uh, when you come across a psalm and, and automatically you connect with it because you identify with it because you've you felt like that before. And so they're very accessible. Now the other thing that the psalms do that we don't always catch that's important for us to catch is how the psalms do take that sort of swing where maybe they start out on a note of, of sadness, but in on a note of celebration. Because that's a good example for us and how we're to turn when we take our, our cares and our concerns and our pains to the Lord, and then we reflect on him and his greatness and his goodness and his grace to us, and that, that we ought to end in, in joy and in, and in gratitude as we reflect on the Lord. So that's a good example for us. So introspection, looking internally in, in your heart and your mind and your life, can be good if it results in praise. If it doesn't hit that, that, that result in praise and focusing your, your mind and your life on the Lord, then it's just navel-gazing that's actually really selfish and really sinful that leaves you in a very bad and dark place if you don't, if you don't make it to the other end of the psalm. Okay, make sense? All right, so what we're doing is breaking in in verse 11 on the celebratory note, on the, on the high note that's remembering the greatness and the goodness of, of who God has done. The key word here that we're talking about this morning that's in this psalm is the word remember. It's the, the Hebrew word zakhar. And, you know, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, gets translated in English. Zakhar means literally to call to mind. It's a very uh, key word, actually, throughout the whole Old, Te Old Testament. It occurs something like 225 times in various forms. I mean, it's in this psalm four different times, just in verse 11, twice in, it, in itself, to call to mind, to remember. Sometimes it's, it's even used of like writing down in order to intentionally remember or to be speaking to others about to remember or creating a memor memorial in order not to forget but to remember. It's to remember, to call to mind. Remembering has this distinct thing about it, that it, it involves you thinking. It involves you using your mind to, to think on, to call to mind. So how do you do that? How do you call things to mind? You think about what's happened in the past. You think about who you are in your life. You have to reflect. You've, you've got to exercise your brain in order to do this. And it's, it's hard. It's not... It's not easy to do. It's actually much easier to forget, isn't it? It's way easier to forget. And forgetting is actually the cause of so much hardship and pain that many go through. Think about just the 
the pain of old age. My, my grandma, um, who I grew up spending summers at her house in Encinitas, and she was just very near and, and dear to me and was one of God's means of grace in, in my life and um, was very close to my grandma. But as, and I would go see her you know, all the time. Uh, even when I was in college down here, probably once a week. But as, as she got older, she, she contracted Alzheimer's, and, and it got harder for her to remember. She'd forget things, and eventually she for, forgot my name, and that was just so tough and so painful and so difficult. We can't remember. It's hard for her. And there's other things that involve, I mean, that's just part of the, the, the pain of old, of old age. Other times, you think about marriages. Uh, 100% of all marriages that have ended in, a, in divorce have happened because one or both parties forgot. They didn't remember. I've married something like 35 plus couples. I don't know, seemingly doing a week uh, marriage wedding every weekend these days. It's just that time of year. Uh, but I've never had, and all the time I have couples come into my office for marriage counseling and I ask them, why do you want to get married? I've, I've never yet had a couple that said, we just want to be miserable and hopefully get a divorce someday. <laughs> like that, that just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, but, but what happens is they forget. They forget what it was like to be in love. They forget the commitment that they made to one another. They forget what God had done in bringing them to that, that place. And so forgetting can have disastrous consequences. It's important for us to remember. Now, remembering actually can have a lot of good benefits. Like if you actually, uh, men, uh, remember your anniversary, that can actually go pretty well for you. I tattooed my anniversary date on my arm so I wouldn't forget, um, you know, just so I wouldn't make that mistake a- a- again, ever again. Um, and so that's been, that's been good. It's good to remember your anniversary and, you know, your, uh, your, your wife's birthday and your kids' birthdays and, and whatnot, important marks in your life. Now, What I want us to transition to in looking at is the reasons why it's important to remember who God is, the works and wonders of God. Uh, God should actually be the easiest thing for us to remember. Psalm 19.1 says, "The, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, night after night, they pour forth knowledge. So every single day that we walk out of our house and you look outside, you ought to be reminded of God and his glory. It should be very difficult to forget because we're, we're put face to face with it day in and day out, and yet we so easily forget God. Familiarity actually has great power to cause us to forget. You forget. I mean, it's kind of like this building. You think about it, you know, we come in here week in, week out. You just, you see all the, the art and the backdrop and, and all the things that set up and the tents outside and all that. And then you come in and you notice everything's different. And then you realize how much is actually done in this place each week to make it beautiful and to make it a place where we can gather as God's people to worship him. His familiarity causes us not to know this and we forget the significance of what's around us. So let's look at some reasons this psalm gives us to remember. It gives us a number of reasons where it calls our attention, it calls our minds to think on about God. I want us for the next number of minutes just to, to kind of set whatever's going on in your heart, in your life, or even the whole new building and all that. Just, 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 just set it aside and together, let's think about God. Let's think about who God is. The being of God. God is the highest thought that you will ever think on. He is the greatest being that you could ever contemplate. There's there's no one or nothing greater that you could think on. God is inexhaustible. He is infinite and eternal. There's an endless amount of things to think on when it comes to God. Think of God. John Calvin says, the manifestations of God's power, wisdom, goodness, and righteousness are clearly exhibited. The glory of God is near us, openly unfolded. It's before us to think on. Now, I want us to look at a few things that this psalm says. First, verse 11 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Verse 12 says, I'll ponder. I'm going to think on them. And then I'm going to meditate on your mighty deeds. The, the works of the Lord, the deeds of the Lord. In, in general, this just tells us, first of all, that God acts. He does things. He does deeds. He does works. He does stuff. It's not like 
He creates the world and everything in it, and then he just steps back, and he's like, I'm done, and now I'm going to go home and rest and not do anything else ever again. He's continually working. He is always at work. Hebrews 1.3 says that God sustains all things by the power of his word. All things. You ever thought why there's a law of gravity, why it's called a law, because it works every single time? It's because God is upholding it. He is making it work, constantly exerting his power. God does that. He is constantly working. He acts, and not only does he act in his world, but he acts in the lives of his people. He acts in and among us for our good. In verse 15, it says that it's with his, with his arm that he redeemed his people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. He has a focus on, on his people. And his, his arm is a, that's a reference to his might, his power, his ability to do anything. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, for anyone he wants. God is that great. It says he is mighty. He uses might. His power is unsurpassed. God is so mighty in what he can do and what he does. Tremper Longman, he's a Bible commentator who's normally pretty, really good on the Psalms and the Proverbs. And, and here's what he says. God's power cannot be fossilized in space and time, but is real to all those who look to him in faith. If we would but see. Many times our our, our greatest problem or difficulty or challenge, the, why we have uh, problems with God and life, is because we're unable to see his power at work. We just don't see it. We don't think he's doing anything. It's a failure to recognize God's might and his power that is at work, that he is actually involved in our lives, in the lives of his people. Now, when it comes to God's great deeds, his great works, there's, there's sort of, when you look at the whole story of God, his story, history throughout the Bible, there's, there's basically four main great works of God. One, obviously, creation, when he created everything. Second, really, really big act of God when he became man, when he took on human flesh and became a God-man in Jesus. That's a big deal. Uh, third great work of God, when he died, on a cross, but rose again three days later. He rose up from the dead. That was a big deal. And then the fourth great work, the restoration of God, that he has planned this one in the future to recreate all things, the heavens and the earth, to recreate them. Those sort of four main great works of God. Now, some would say there's this distinct work of redemption, but really all of it from creation and incarnation and resurrection and restoration is all of God's work of redemption, redeeming his people. God's focus has been his people from the start, before there was a start. Isaiah 43, chapter 21 says that he, he formed people for his glory, for his name. Formed them for his name. God created a, a world so that people could live in it and then came into the world in Jesus in order to redeem his people. God is at Work, he appropriates that to us, his people. The children of Jacob and Joseph. We've been getting to know for a number of weeks uh, Abraham and then the last couple of weeks with Isaac and then we'll learn there's um, Isaac's son and, and grandsons, uh, the Jacob and, and Joseph. They're the, the children of the promise, right? And we too are the children of the promise if we believe in the same God who provides the same righteousness through faith that he did for them, it becomes ours. This is talking about us. For his children, he is our great heavenly father. Really, you know, in the Old Testament, the, the most popular term for God's people that got, ended up being used was Israel. In the New Testament, the most popular term for God's people is church. That we're his church. A church isn't a building. It's not this place or, or our new place. It's not a business. It's not about all of the the money, even though it takes money to run a church. Uh, it's a body. It's a people. People working together, each have a part. Ephesians 4 talks about this, and it says that, you know, the, the church is kind of like a, a body. Jesus is the head, and then there's different members of the body. You know, there's arms, and there's 
there's legs and there's, you know, hands and there's, there's feet. And it's been so neat actually just seeing all of that, all the different people that have been contributing, just different members of the body at the new building, you know, trying to, some painting and some doing construction and some with, you know, electrical and AV and just all kinds of stuff in each part, you know, working together and seeing the body grow. Some of the funnest parts of what's been going on is just working alongside one another, just doing stuff together, the unity of our body. The body, it's, it's people. We're the redeemed people who are to remember God's work. Why do we remember? Because what his work is, is wonderful. It's wonder. Look at verse 11 and verse 14. It says, it calls his works wonders. They're wonders of old. And then verse 14, God, he's by definition the God who does works wonders. He's a wonderful God. He does wonders. Wonder. I I could be wrong about this, but I, I think it's actually wonder that makes worship. I'm not sure if you can really worship if you're not in wonder. You know, Jesus said that true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. Man, if it's in spirit and truth, you're going to be amazed at seeing God as he actually is, that he's so wonderful. Wonder. No wonder, no worship. God is wonderful. It's, it, it's, it's just almost... Too good to, to, to believe. Too good to be true when you get a hold of who God actually is. Uh, next thing it says here in verse 13 that God's way, God, our God, he is holy. Holy. He is righteous and good and true in the ocean of God's existence. There's not a single drop of sin or unrighteousness or evil. He's wholly good in all that he is and all that he does. And more than that, what is good, it actually just flows out of his being. It's who he is. He is the fountain of it. Anything is good, anything that's ever good that you ever experience is because God is good and it comes from him. He's holy, pure, true, through and through. God is holy. Now some translations, they actually have um, in the sanctuary here because it's in the gathered people where we just recognize the holiness of God, his greatness. It's, it's worship. When we, when we wonder at God and we see his greatness and his goodness and who he is and what he has done, it evokes praise, both individually and corporately among us. And we see that. We just see the uniqueness of God. You know, if you look at verse 13, it says, what God is great like our God. I mean, you can study all the world religions, every single religion of the world, every single belief system, every single God that anyone has ever talked about. None ever compares to this God. They're, they, they're far short. None of them are as powerful. None of them are as good. None of them are as kind. None of them are as active or gracious. The other gods of the world, they make you do this or that in order to earn their favor. These other gods, they can fly off the handle. They're so much like human beings and they get angry and withhold their kindness and goodness. Not God. Who's great like him? None. None compared to this God. The God of the Bible. God is real and he's for us and he just gives and he gives and he gives and serves and loves his people and is committed to doing so forever. That's why our theme for the year is the given much who give much, because we're just recognizing that our God is a God who gives. He's given to us. He's given us everything. He's given us life and breath, and he's given us his son, Jesus, for our salvation. He serves us and gives to us. All of our lives are really, they're just different stories, different journeys all you know there's certain things that each one of us has experienced is a story of each of our lives but what makes each one of our stories meaningful instead of meaningless is when they get connected to the grand story of god otherwise your story your life if it's not connected to the grand story of god it's not rooted in anything that's that's really real or really matters but if it gets connected to who god is be a part of who he is and what he is doing in his world and his story. It's what makes it meaningful. It's what makes it matter. So uh, with this, I want us to transition a little bit to some stories, some stories to remember. Really, when we think about each of our stories, they're a retelling of the story of God. 
creation, incarnation, resurrection, restoration. It's what he's done through the gospel in our life. He's our creator. He's our maker. We're made in his image. We've fallen because of sin, so he sent his son into the world who died on a cross and rose again, gives us new life. We get recreated. We're new creations. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new when we start following him. And then he's remaking the world one day. He's weeding out the sin in our lives until his son comes again and we get to see him face to face. Stories that matter. Now, individual stories, our individual stories matter. Each one of you, your lives matter. God cares about you. And I think about my life. There's, there's certain, and same thing with your life, there's certain events, there's certain things that have happened that make you who you are. They're kind of like life markers. I've got some of those. You know, I, I can think about, I've got some life markers before I became a Christian. You know, when I, um, was, when I left home, you know, I remember running away from home um, in the night and through rain, barefoot, and not coming home for days, and I was just running from God, really. I, I, I remember, you know, life marker when, um, when I was a freshman in 1996 at Point Loma Nazarene University down the street in Young Hall dorm, and I remember at 2 in the morning giving up and stopped running from God and becoming a Christian. I, I remember not long after that, about a year later, on the sunset cliffs out there overlooking the water when I was just reading the word and just knew that God was calling me into vocational ministry to be a pastor and embracing God's call in my life to be a minister. I remember that. It's a marker. I remember, um, you know, a little while after that, a couple years later, being in Portugal, I was backpacking through Europe, surfing <laughs> by myself, and, and, and I remember um, one night just realizing how much I loved this girl named Amy and wanted to marry her. And uh, there's, I had, there's a little rock where I was praying. So I took that rock and I wrote on it and, and I had to sit on my desk. Um, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it, you know, it can be helpful to help you remember. You know, some of you, you know, I have the journal. I don't write in all the time. But sometimes I write in it when God's really done something big in my life, a key event. Some of you journals, you journal every day, great. Keep doing that. Maybe some of you, you got to get a, you do stuff to help yourself remember. Get a journal, get a rock or something, you know. Uh, Remember what God has done in your life because it'll, you'll forget. It'll be easy to forget, and those memories will fade. Um, the benefit of remembering is that it calms our fears and it helps us resist temptation. So if you think about this, um, fear, usually our fears are connected with the future. We're afraid of what, what's going to happen or what's not going to happen, what could happen. Um, and it's really underneath that is a distrust or a disbelief that God will be with us or be for us in what happens. But if we can remember what he's done in the past, oh, when he was with us here and he did this here and he did this here, then that gives us confidence and assurance that he will be with us here, here, and here in the future, and it calms our fears. We see that our God is with us and has been with us, so he will surely not abandon us. God is not a God who changes his mind. He doesn't, he doesn't start his work in you and then abandon it. He will be with us in the future. It calms our fears. Helps us resist temptation when we remember God's work in our lives because then when we hit those tough spots, we hit those, those trials that God brings into our life that Scripture says will come and, and we'll, be, we'll be tempted to leave the God that we love. Remember, no, God has been good to us. He cares for us. He cares for me. I know where that road goes. I've been down that road, the road of sin and, 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 and leaving God. I'm not going down that road. I'm going to stay with God, even though this is difficult right now. Helps us resist temptation when we remember what God's done. Individual stories, individual lives that, that matter to God. And we recognize that it, it's it's. Psalm, or actually, Second Chronicles 16, 9, it says this. Uh, God's eyes, they roam to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those hearts that are fully committed to him. God cares about each and every one of your lives and your stories. Jesus says God knows the very number of hairs on your head. I mean, God knows so much. I mean, there's not a computer that can hold that amount of information, and God knows it and cares for you and your life and your story. Your story matters. And just as much as our stories matter and it's important for us to, to 
remember um, what he's done in our lives. It's important for us to remember the things that he's done in our church, in the life of our church. There's individual stories and there's church stories. Several psalms like this one, they recount some of the great deeds of God among his people. This one, if we kept reading through the end of the psalm, we read about the Red Sea and Sinai. The Red Sea, when God delivered his people out of Egypt on dry ground by parting the sea. Sinai, when God gave the Ten Commandments, wrote them with his finger and gave them to Moses. These great works and deeds of God. Think about our church. I want to tell some stories of our church. Some of you, you've heard bits and pieces you know, maybe some of you have never heard it at all, but just to tell you some of the things that, that God's done in our church that I think we ought, to, we ought to remember for all of our days and that, that what God's done in our church. So um, some highlights not to forget, some things he's done in and through this building. So just a few stories. First, um, our church, it started out, um, we started out in an apartment in Pacific Beach in April 2005. Here's a, here's a picture of just the handful of us. There's about six or eight of us, I guess, that when we first started. Some of you can see Ricky Warner in there. I think he was like 17 or 18 back then. Um, just uh, awesome. He's been with us since almost day one. Uh, you know, we didn't really start the church in the traditional way that you know, people start a church where you, you know, gather a bunch of money, you get a building, and you raise a, uh, you fly your whole neighborhood, and then you're like open for business. You know, I was, I, I reading through the book of Acts, and I'm like, okay, God's called me to start a church. What do I do? Well, like Paul gets thrown in jail, and a church gets started. He um, gets in a fight with a witch, and then a church gets started. Uh, I wasn't quite ready to go to jail or get in a fight with a, with a Wiccan. I am now, but, um, it, you know, uh, so we just figured we'll start a Bible study in our apartment and, and see what happens and 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 so we we started there in april 2005 and and you know we started on sunday evening and what we would do is we would have church um we would just uh i'll tell you what we were studying here in a minute but we study the bible and then we'd have communion we didn't have music in the beginning and then we throw a barbecue we throw this party and then we invite all of our neighbors and our co-workers and anybody we'd meet to to come to our this party and um you know, if people, and then eventually people started coming earlier, coming for, for church. If they were a Christian, we were like, no, sorry, we, we're only interested in non-Christians coming because uh, we were really intent. Like, we didn't want to be a church that grew from transfer growth, from other churches coming to be part of our church. We want to reach people who didn't know Jesus. Um, well, what happened is we're studying God's word. Um, more and more people started coming to church, and before we knew it, they're just people like, you know, down, sitting down the halls and around the corner in the kitchen, so they couldn't even see where we were, the, where the main group was, but they were just hearing it. And so we realized, we're like, man, we need to find a space. And so um, my wife and I, we started doing, like, prayer driving, like, with your eyes open, but driving. And we would drive around all of Pacific Beach and all around here, and I would literally, I mean, we I don't know how many days we did it, and we'd do it for hours, just drive around. We'd look in a building, you know, any building that looked somewhat a decent size, and we'd be like, I wonder if there's a big open room in there we could meet at, you know? And so we were driving down the street one night, and I'll never forget it, we pulled in the driveway and came around, looked in, I'm like, I wonder if there's a space in there, and came and checked it out the next morning, and sure enough, there was this room, and they rented it to us at, at that point in the very beginning for $50 a service. So for the first, I don't know, year or two or something like that, we paid 200 bucks a month basically to meet in this place. And, and this place has been a huge blessing to us. Um, I think here's a, here's a picture of our first for service here in this place. Some of the colors were a little different, but we just kind of angle chairs over here and to the, the side and, you know, and um, this, this building has been a, a major, major blessing to us as, as God has grown us as a church. So that's kind of number one, just kind of how we just started out from super small beginnings. Book of Zechariah says, don't, don't uh, despise the days of small beginnings. We just start with a handful of people, you know, people who were pursuing Jesus, loving the Bible, started an apartment, found this place, and then we've just grown and grown and grown. Um, story number two, and I think about the things that have, have stuck out, um, is um, things that God has done, is God's word. You know, our ministry philosophy from day one has always been the word of God does the work of God. And so we want to be a church that was founded on the gospel. And so, um, you know, I was, it's, it was probably a little over ambitious. I was like 26 when we started the church. And I'm like, well, if we're going to be about the gospel, we're going to study the Bible, we're going to do the book of Romans. And if you know anything about the Bible, Romans is probably like <laughs> the most difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I wore a collar back then because I wasn't ready to cut my hair, but I wanted people to take me seriously. So, um, yeah. 
But, you know, um, I, don't, I don't remember uh, probably most or any, if any uh, sermons that I've preached. Sometimes I'll go back and I'll read a manuscript or listen to something. I don't even, I don't remember that. Most of you probably don't remember that. But um, what I remember is God's work that he's done through his word. You know, since we started this church coming up on nine years next month, I mean, we've, we went through the book of, all the book of Romans, all the book of Nehemiah, all the book of Jonah, all the book of Matthew, all of the book of Titus, all the book of Acts. I mean, and now we're going through the book of Genesis. I mean, that's a lot of books of the Bible. And we've just gone through every single word, every single chapter, every single verse. And we just, I mean, we're just a real simple church. The word of God does the work of God. And, and that, the what I do remember is the work of God. You know, I, I can look out at faces and, and I can remember um, times or, or sermons or things that we hit, you know, and, and afterward you, you come back and asking me to pray for you or us meeting later in the week and seeing how God's changed your life through his word. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing. God's work does his, his word. It's really how this church has, has been, was birthed and how it's grown. It's by God's word. That's been our foundation. Uh, Story number three uh, I want to share is, is leadership. So I, uh, I planted the church with what I thought were some good guys uh, to be leaders alongside me. Uh, it turned out not to be. I lost all the guys. There were four other guys that I started the church with and lost all of them to either uh, sexual immorality, uh, drugs, uh, or drunkenness. And so I was left alone um, after uh, dealing with all of that. And I remember, I believe it was around 2006, I was just ready to throw in the towel. I remember sitting in my office and just be like, God, I quit. Um, what am I going to do? And I felt stuck because I, I kind of put all my, um, what's that phrase? You, know, you put all your eggs in a basket. I don't know who put eggs in a basket, but I put all my eggs in this basket. Um, and, but then I was like, what else am I going to do? I have three degrees that are all in theology, so I don't know what other kind of job I can go do. Um, I'm stuck, like, and I'm not really interested in going backward and being a youth pastor or a college pastor again. I was just stuck, and so uh, that was God's good grace to, to get me stuck and just to stick it through. Um, but I needed other leaders, other solid leaders. And uh, so one Sunday, uh, it just, it's, it's embarrassing to share, but we, our church kind of got tagged as, as the sort of punk rock church right away. We were like the tattooed, pierced up, you know, crazy church or whatever. I think some people thought we were a cult. But um, you literally had to like walk through a bill of smoke to get through the doors because they were just like, you know, chain smoking before service started for some reason. Um, but one service, uh, God brought a guy named Ron Brewersman, his wife Kathy, to our church, and nobody talked to them, and I, they came in a little bit late, and then after the sermon, they just, like, beelined straight out. They're like, we got to get out of this place. And um, I ran after them. Here's a picture of Ron and Kathy um, not long after they came. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I don't know who you are or why you're here, but I just want you to know we need some wise hairs around here. He's like, did you say white hair? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so come to find out, Ron and Kathy... Uh, Ron had been a pastor at another church uh, for like 30 years that he helped start a church plant. And their, um, their last child had moved out of the house, and they were really praying and seeking the Lord about what do you want for us next in this season of life. And um, they were like, you know, that was really neat when we helped get the church started, you know, about 30 years ago and at that time. And, and so they started looking for a young church plant that was reformed in its, its theology that they could go help start. <laughs> and so somehow, I don't know how, um, God um, got them to start coming to our church. And um, about a year, a year and a half later, Ron became the first pastor alongside me. And then after him, Pastor James. And now we've got like 33, you know, people in leadership development, just some solid um, leaders. And we've got more pastors on the horizon and deacons. And God is just bless the leadership here in in the church it's just been it's just been awesome uh, quality leaders it really is what makes uh, a church healthy uh, and strong so that's a uh, story number three story number four uh, another year goes by amy and i um, amy got pregnant with our first uh, child with adina and um, we had her in 2007 and I think that was her first Sunday here. <laughs> I don't, it, that picture is so grainy. I don't think we had digital cameras back then or something. Um, but uh, about a, Adina was about a year old, and Amy and I, our hearts just really started to ache. Um, 
we had a deep pain and sadness that, that she was the only kid in the church. So we shared this with our community group uh, one night, just that we had been hurting because we loved our church, but we didn't want our daughter to, to grow up being the only kid in the church. And so um, our community group prayed for us, and one of the gals, a couple of the girls kind of together, I think it was Ashley, who's now Ashley Warner, her and uh, this girl named Jackie, they concocted this plan to do this big, like, Easter, like, in the park outreach with kids. I think we got a picture of that. Um, and so they did this in this park right over here, and they did, like, face painting and sack races and bubbles, and you can see just tons of kids came out. Not a single one of them ever came to the church. Um, <laughs> But, but what it did is God, like, used that to put it on the radar of, of our church that we needed kids. I was just praying. I was like, God, please send a crying baby during my sermon. I want to hear it. Like, that, to this day, that does not ever bug me. Um, know that, moms. Um, so, you know, it's just amazing. I, I'll remember Ricky, I mean, it's long before they even met, but, like, I had asked him to start setting up a nursery in this other room, and he set up this, like, nursery, moving this table and doing all this stuff. Like, I don't know, it was, like, six or eight months, and he came to me one morning, and he was like, Dwayne, do you really want me to keep setting up this thing? There's no other kids here. And I was like, yep, keep doing it. Because, like, the day the family comes and there's nothing here for them, there's no chance of them ever coming back. So at least maybe they'll feel loved if there's, like, something there for them. So, yeah, thanks, Ricky, for setting up the nursery. Um, it's you, all your credit now that there's, like, over 60 kids that go through um, you know, on a Sunday back there. Isn't that amazing? Just, I mean, what God has done just blows my mind. Um, I, along with that, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, we, uh, we we were always set up in town. It was before we had storage and these other rooms here that we, we now rent out. But um, basically everything that we needed to have service here was stored in my closet at our apartment at the time. And so a guy would come to our church and, like, I mean, come to our house early in the morning and, like, load up everything in my truck. And we'd, and we'd come over here and we'd set it all up. And I would set up every week. And so I'd be, like, all sweaty and nasty and then try and transition and preach. And then um, God brought along Dan Calvert, who made, you know, the Calverts. And he was like, you know, this is, like, set up and tear down thing, like, sucks. It's a drag. And he's like, it's, but we need to see it as a ministry. And so he renamed it Building Transformation Ministry as a uh, trick to get people to serve, um, which worked. Uh, that, you know, the transforming this building is an outward expression of how God's transformed um, our, our hearts and, and our lives. And so that was just a really uh, a key, you know, move for us. The next thing, story, you know, um, we had so many tools, like, leading music, people that liked good music and could play good music, but just when it, when it turned out, they didn't really love Jesus. And so we hit a point where we were like, no more music. And so we would just like read a psalm and listen to like Johnny Cash or Cigarettes or Explosions in the Sky during communion. <laughs> like it was kind of weird, but kind of cool. Um, but, uh, you know, we just started praying that God would send a music person along that was like actually solid, that could do good music and actually love Jesus. And, and God brought along Sean Hutchinson. And, and now, I mean, he's just developed the music worship ministry. We have four full bands that rotate each week. And it's just, just amazing. That's a big kind of standout highlight. Um, just so many of these, these things, you know, you just see, thinking about these, these stories, so many stories of God bringing in people. It's not about the building. It's just been a, a tool and what God's done in people, in and through the building. There's stories of people. I was talking to somebody before the first service, and they were like, oh, this is kind of, um, this is so surreal and kind of sad because this is where I, I met my husband, and, and this is where I've had both my kids baptized, you know, or dedicated, and and, and, and just, I mean, it's, it's crazy, you know, thinking about, like, stuff that's happened in this building and in this place. I mean, it's, it's the stories of our lives and the stories of our church welded together. Um, and God's just been gracious to us. I remember we moved to two services. That was a big, scary deal. And then we added a, a third evening service. And then, you know, a year and a half ago, having that, creating that building committee because we could see the handwriting on the wall that we were outgrowing this place. And, but then there's just enormous cost that that seemed. And then God just really dropping this new building into our lap that doesn't require a a CUP, the zoning with it, that cost, can cost like $100,000. And so this building we really look at, the 544 Napa, where we'll meet next week all together at 10 a.m., is, is, is just we just see it as like a gift of God um, that God has blessed our church with. Each one of these areas, and we just look back. So you look backward, it's like, oh, God has been with us here and here and here and here. It's just so clear. It is so clear that God has been doing wonderful things in and among us. 
in and among the Resolve Church. It's just huge. This next month, we'll celebrate nine years of being a church, almost ten years. I, 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 am, I am so grateful to God that it's so clear his hand, his might, his power, his arm at work. It makes me so excited to see what God is going to do in the next ten years because I think this is just the start. It's just the start. We're just starting to scratch the surface of what God is and wants to do in and among and through us in the city of San Diego. I can't wait to see it. So with that, what I kind of want to do is uh, pull things together, prepare our hearts for communion. Um, in thinking through the psalm and some of the things it calls us to and calling us to remember, got to be honest with ourselves. We don't remember. We forget. We're good at forgetting. Some of the greatest and best things that God does in our life, we forget them. And they fade. God calls us to act to wonder at him, to worship him for his deeds, we fail. We fail at worship. We don't do it when we know we should. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it comes to us and it says this, God never forgets. He never forgets us. And God has acted for us on our behalf. Ephesians 1 says that God shows us in Christ before the very foundation of the world. Before God created the world, he planned for you to be born and for those of you who are his to know Jesus, to send his son, to die on the cross and to rise again. That took years. God didn't forget. He saw to it. Philippians 1, 6 says that he who began a good work in you will continue to bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God does not forget. He acts for you. He acts chiefly on the cross. One of the main places our name comes from is from 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Uh, one translation, it says, I resolved to do nothing among, while I was among you except Christ and him crucified. That's our goal. We're a really, really simple church. We just want to know Jesus, know him crucified because what Jesus did for us on our behalf is he took our sin our failure, our forgetting, our forgetting who God is, that we're made in his image, that we belong to him, and that we've run from him, took all that on himself, and he died for us on the cross and rose again. It's all about Jesus. I just want to know him and be known by him. Jesus, when he instituted when he created the Lord's Supper, this thing that we celebrate each week. It says he took bread and he said, this is my body given for you. He took the wine and said, this is the blood of my new covenant for you. He pays the price. He stands in your place, taking on your sin and mine. Our, our failure to act and wonder at God takes it on himself as if it were his own, suffers the wrath of God, dies, and then rises again to give us new life. He says, when he says that, and he gives the bread and the wine, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget what I have done for you. Don't forget the significance of Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. There is nothing greater. The goodness and grace of God collides on the cross what Jesus has done for you. So, today when you respond, come and just remember God's work in your life. Remember the cross and what he's done for you. There's things that you know you need God to do in you. Lay that on the table and ask him to work because he's worked in the past. He'll work in the future. Remember, let's remember who we are as a church. We're just about Jesus, just trying to follow him, and he's building his church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18 that he will build his church. And isn't it clear that he's been doing that? So wonderful what God has done. Let's worship our great God and wonder at him. Let's pray.